All right, here we go. Another live Instagram q and I hope we've got some people waiting this time. I tried to promote this a couple days in advance. Hopefully that works. Trying a new time. This is now an afternoon q and It's 4 p.m. Pacific. Um, trying different times. It's kind of hard because, you know, this watch game is an international thing. So I'm trying to pick, you know, something that works in a time zone that the most people can participate. Usually I like a little bit earlier in the morning, but I had a bunch to do today. So here we are, 4 p.m. Pacific, uh, nighttime on the East Coast. We're, uh, we're all over the world. So let's uh, stall for a couple minutes. We'll let a couple people get in here. Got some action, but I'll wait a little bit more. It's uh, crazy windy in Los Angeles today. So I apologize if you hear that in the background, but here we go. Hi. All right, I'm going to dig in. The rest of you can catch this up on the replays. These are all uh, evergreen on the channel for, uh, you know, after these. So I publish them after the live thing is over. So if you miss it, it's not a big deal. You know, it's fun to have people live and people that can comment and sometimes we can riff on those. But if you miss it, you can always catch up later. And I'm trying to do things that, you know, are still interesting uh, weeks later. You know, we're not commenting on the the score of the football game or something like that. Um, generally watch stuff is is more or less evergreen. So let's dig into it. Uh, easiest question this week was, what is my favorite variant of the Urwerk 105? Uh, so for this, we can just go to the watch. I happen to have it right here. Boom, bronze, Maverick. How could this not be the coolest one? Right, we got it all. So first of all, the coolest 105s are these, with the top that flips up. That's just kind of the coolest feature of the 105 to me. The open ones are neat too, and you get the colors and you get to see it all the time, but why not have the top that flips if you can, right? And now, why not be bronze? I think it's the only bronze or work. It's the only one I can think of. And it's just a cool material. It wears interestingly. You can see like there's some variation in the actual metal which is cool. Uh, it can be refinished, uh, unlike the uh, color-coded, I think they make a blue one and a black one. Um, so yeah, 105 Maverick. That's the coolest one for sure. Bam, next one. Okay, this is a little bit trickier of a question. How do I price independent watches, like the small independents that are not as liquid or maybe have no market uh, history or not for a long time or whatever. And this is one that is definitely a little bit more of an art than it is a science. Um, first of all, there are, you know, a lot of watches do trade hands that, uh, that are not public. So in almost always, I can find some sort of relative comp that has transacted at some point. And usually because I've been around this game now for, God, 18 years, um, I, I've seen these things kind of come and go a little bit. So I know who I can call, who I can ask about certain things. Sometimes I, you know, I, I try to ask dealers because they know, you know, I have to figure out dealer prices on things and they know that game a little bit. Sometimes I just ask my private customers. A, a lot of times the most educated people on this stuff are the actual collectors who really know these watchmakers and, and such. So I do have some uh, private customers that I rely on. Um, sometimes it is just uh, a matter of, my kind of experience with comparable watches, you know, uh, this watchmaker is similar to this one and this model is similar to this one. And so these are this and this is, you know, that plus or minus whatever. Um, and sometimes it has to go all the way just to like the object itself of, you know, what is this watch? It's a, it's a time only watch. It uses uh, some sort of uh, base movement that's been, uh, changed or something like that. So we have a general price range for that, or it's a, it's a handmade one-off tourbillon. Uh, so we'll have, you know, some sort of price range for that. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's definitely more of an art than it is a science. Uh, I 
try to be fairly conservative. At the end of the day, my business is me spending my own money on stuff and hoping to sell it for, you know, a little bit more. So uh, generally, if I think, let's say maybe I think it's worth between 20 and $30,000, then then 20 is kind of the number that I need to be at, or maybe even 18 or 17, uh, if I think that th those are kind of the sell numbers eventually. Um, and, and ultimately, every now and then, a, a customer, you know, the person who bought the watch and is trying to sell it may be the one who knows the most about the watch, um, in which case I have to uh, sometimes listen to them. And if there's somebody that I trust, oftentimes that is a good situation to do a consignment. So I don't love doing consignment. I prefer to just buy watches, sell them. It's then at my own pace. The incentives are aligned better. I, I prefer it like that. But um, but maybe this is a good situation where the guy says, look, I know this watch is worth 50 grand. And I say, man, I'm looking at it. To me, it, it really looks like 20. Um, but look, if you think it's worth 50, let's give it a shot at, at maybe 40 and uh, send it on consignment so I don't have to take the risk. And if I can get you, uh, if I can get 45 or whatever, you get 40, I make five grand and uh, everybody wins. But, you know, usually I tend to be right. My gut honestly tends to be right. More often, those people are kind of overvaluing their own watch and the thing just sits and doesn't really sell. Um, but sometimes it, it has, and I've had that work out really well. So uh, it, it's just a balance of all those factors, figuring out uh, the market. And then, of course, once you do that once, okay, now I have that data point to use the next time. And you've once I've done several of those, which I, I have over 18 years, uh, you have a nice little kind of catalog to go through to figure it all out. But it, it's definitely a tricky part of this. And it's been made way trickier over the last few years where there's been so much pricing volatility. So it used to be that I had a pretty good handle on the pricing of most things. And if there was some you know, oddball, at least I could easily compare it to something else that I knew very well and rock solidly. But now I feel like my my pricing numbers are just all jumbled on on everything, even the stuff that I used to really, really know. And so uh, there is there really isn't a lot of solid ground at all. And I'm, I'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants and hoping hoping to make it all work. So uh, no question, the market's adjusted some. The the indie market has adjusted a lot less, you know, well, uh, maybe adjusted fully, but the, the actual numbers that things have gone down are a lot less than the kind of really hot stuff that I think all of the, the fake money uh, that the Fed printed went into the 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 Royal Oaks and the the Rolexes and the Nautiluses and uh, and stuff like that. So uh, I think there's a lot of actual genuine new demand in the in the Indian indie world. So you know, whereas the 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 hip stuff went up like this and then dropped like this, the indie stuff maybe has gone up like this and dropped like this, uh, and and hopefully we're reaching some sort of kind of point of stability. But I have adjusted prices of a lot of stuff on my my website, which I, I hadn't done ever. I, I, I don't ever recall um, l actually lowering prices on my site. Uh, so, I, so I went and did that. And I think uh, we're at a, at a pretty stable point where we can start building some knowledge again, I hope at least. Okay, now the big one. People ask me what I thought of the new Recepi release. And the first thing I thought of when I got that question is, wow, I would love to talk about this, but I have no idea how to say this guy's name. How do I do a YouTube talking about this watch when I have no idea how to say this guy's name? So I asked him and let's hear the answer. Ready? This is the definitive name. Ah, come on, work, buddy. Jeff that rejecti. Jeff that rejecti. <laughs> Can you hear it? Jeff that rejecti. Jeff that rejecti. That's the man himself telling us. So basically, they're like J's. Jeff that rejecti. I told him I would get it right. I hope I'm pretty good. I'm sure I'm missing some subtleties. Jevdet Rejepi. Okay, let's look at the watch. So, 
Spoiler alert, first, let's start with the lead here. I love it. I love this watch. It's probably my favorite new release in a while. Um, and I, I'm gonna go over a couple reasons why. So first of all, it's just beautiful. I love the color combination, the white metal with this sort of um, steel gray blue dial uh, just knocks it out of the park to me. And then having the gilded movement showing through all of that to just add that, that bit of warmth to the very cool colors just crushes it. Uh, but there are some very uh, interesting design details here that uh, I, I just love. So first of all, let, let's look at the case, which is the fourth picture here. That's sick. What an incredibly beautiful case. These lugs and the length of the lugs and the shape and then the way that the case comes to basically a point at the midpoint uh, it is, is stunning case, uh, and, and which makes sense because I know that the brothers use, uh, have, have Hogman working in-house for them making cases. I assume he worked on this one as well. So just an absolutely beautiful case. I love the dial and I love the, the design elements. So you have this really cool hour hand that I've never quite seen anything like. It's this like lollipop hour hand. And then the minute hand is just straight with a red tip. And then these markers are really interesting. So you have these kind of slivered markers here, but I love these, these hour markers that are uh, just sort of flat, shiny little lines going around that, that inner piece. I've never quite seen that and it adds a really interesting textural and, uh, and three-dimensional element to the whole thing. Uh, I, I just think the design of this piece, before we even get to the complications, the design is, is knocked out of the park. Um, so we know the finishing is going to be great. Uh, that's kind of what, what these guys are known for. And the movement is beautiful. I love this very classic um, po pocket watch looking movement here. It looks like it's gonna have a lot of depth. It'll probably be sort of very sumptuous. I'm sure this, this will be like a beautiful black polish here. Um, and you've got uh, these nice uh, angled pieces there. But in general, you're gonna have one section where you have these really nice like uh, Geneva stripes basically. And then the relief and under it, you're gonna get this beautiful graining with these nicely finished pieces above it. I can already see exactly what it's gonna look like and I think it's going to be uh, going to be really beautiful. And now the complication itself is this really cool idea where the second hand gets stopped at 60. It looks like it's making a 60 second rotation, but it's actually making a 58 second rotation. And at 60, it stops for two seconds, stores up the power and then releases it to jump the minute hand forward. So the minute hand is jumping each time. Uh, it's unclear exactly to me what the hour hand is doing here. In the, uh, this is obviously a rendering. The hour hand is actually fully on 10, even at 10, 10. So I don't know if this is gonna jump as well. I tend to think it probably won't, but uh, but maybe it will. It, it doesn't say anywhere in here. Maybe, maybe somebody knows. Um, but I love this complication. Uh, I, I love it for, for a couple reasons. Now, first of all, one thing I really do not like in terms of complications are complications that make time telling like deliberately harder to read. I don't mind interesting time telling things. Like obviously Urwork is all about kind of interesting uh, indicators to show the time. And I, and I love stuff like that. But things like uh, like the Frank Mueller, like crazy hours or the, the Richard Meal uh, that jumbles the time. That's, those are never my favorite things. They're fun. They can be, you know, kind of interesting sometimes, but the idea of like deliberately making it more difficult to tell time is a little bit annoying to me. Uh, but stuff that does the opposite is really cool. Right, so any uh, sort of dead seconds, uh, this, let's call it dead minutes, um, the uh, chronographs that instantaneously jump, anything like that, I, I really dig. Uh, one really cool example of that is the Gronfell uh, Torbion. If you've never seen my review, uh, go check that out, but that has uh, a, re a really cool version of this. Um, uh, just the, this idea of, of a time-telling comp 
application, but this is one I've never seen before. And it is, uh, it, it's cool for a couple reasons. So first of all, it's useful. It's nice to see the minute exactly on the minute. It makes it easier to tell the time. It makes it easier to set the time. And it's, uh, it's, it's just a totally useful thing. But beyond that, it's really poetic in that uh, the way that it kind of stops and then moves and releases, once a minute, it's like building up this tension and then releasing it like a, like a great piece of classical music or something like that. Um, it, it, it always has this, uh, this tension between the starting and the stopping, which is, uh, it's just a very interesting poetic complication and ultimately cool to look at. It's great to have stuff in watches that that move, that, that do things that draw your attention. Um, you know, I've, I've pointed this out also with the Gronfeld uh, Remontoir. You know, the thing twirls around every eight seconds. You don't have to know anything about horology uh, to just think it's cool to have a little thing that twirls around on the dial every eight seconds. Um, and same for this, to have something that you can look at every minute that actually does something, it's a very uh, nice way to live with a watch. Uh, th these are things that I've learned after, you know, living with almost every great watch that's been made over the last few decades. Uh, these things actually matter because there are times, look, uh, today I was sitting in traffic and then I went to the dentist and I was in a waiting room and they're, they're like, you're bored, you're there, I've got nothing. I try not to be on my phone all the time. It's cool to just kind of look down at my watch, catch it for a glimpse and, you know, maybe it's at, 46 seconds and now just the like waiting, uh, the waiting for it to go from 46 to 60, w wait for two seconds and go. It's like, uh, you know, it sounds stupid. It sounds ridiculous. I don't know what this watch costs, but I'm sure it's very expensive to pay all this money for, for something like that. But the reality is we do live with these watches. We do have them. They are a part of your life. And these, these complications that can actually draw you in even for a few seconds here or there, make a big difference in the experience of actually owning one of these objects. Um, so I do really, 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 really love this watch. I think he knocked it out of the park in design, in complication, in potential finish and the design of the finishing and the movement itself, and in terms of a poetic complication, uh, you know, how much better could you get? And the size is perfect. It's 38 millimeters, um, which is like, you know, look, I sell a lot of big watches to, to make the kind of three-dimensional sculptures that I really love. You have to go big a lot of the times. Uh, you know, all these people are like, well, I love it, but it's too big and blah, blah, blah. Well, that's the point. It's gotta be big in order to do this stuff. You need the space to make a Grubel 4 -C. You can't make a 38 millimeter you know, thin watch and do the same things. But for the few watches that can be made in that size and still represent something poetic and interesting and beautiful, uh, it, it's a lovely size to wear and it looks great and people just love it. That's the way to sell a watch. If you can make something great at that size, you're gonna sell a lot of watches. Uh, and so I think he knocked it out of the park. It's a, it's a top notch effort and I can't wait to, to see one. I hope I see one at some point. I, I'd love to have one, but at the very least, I'd love to see one. Uh, so cool. Let me check here. Um, yeah, I wonder how many questions you got on this. Exactly. That's, uh, that's a good, uh, like, it's funny. I got a few, I'm trying to just pick a few questions for each of these, not go on and on and on. So I got a few, like kind of the normal random questions. And then this watch was released and immediately every other question that I got was about this watch. So uh, I think obviously these brothers are hitting it out of the park. They've really captured the attention of uh, the group of people who are into this sort of stuff, where I would imagine most of the Rajepi fans uh, overlap with the TikToking fans quite a bit. So, so my guys are super into this stuff, paying attention to it, and uh, they're right on top of it. And there's a good reason for it, because this is a, a killer watch. So uh, hello from Michigan, hello from Orange County, California. Uh, hello, uh, yeah, hello, everywhere. Uh, the price is 83 Swiss. Wow, that's really good. I would have actually thought it was more than that. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, this person asked, is Acrivia no longer associated with the brothers? 
do they still work together? I'm pretty sure they still work together. Um, he just wanted to also have his own. And then the idea that I understood with Acrivia was that that was their kind of more uh, avant-garde pieces were going to be in the Acrivia line. And then uh, Recep did his kind of classic watch line. And now uh, Jevdet has done his classic watch line. So it'll be interesting to see what they actually produce. Everything that they make now is so oversubscribed that I think it's probably difficult to jump back and forth between all of these projects because they're they're just going to be swamped with orders on all of the stuff. But um, anyway, fun checking in with you guys. Thank you for the questions. Uh, you can also, uh, if you don't use Instagram or, or you don't like submitting things uh, via there, if you submit questions in like, let's say the comments to this video for the next one, I'll read them there. Uh, you can, you can of course email me if you like as well. Uh, I do sell watches. Uh, they're up at tiktoking.com. Uh, actually the, the bronze, uh, Maverick 105 that I showed you guys earlier just sold today. Um, so yeah, I'd love to do deals. I buy watches, I trade watches. So uh, yeah, hit me up, Steve at tiktoking.com for, for any business we might be able to do. And I will definitely check back in. I'm trying to do these on Tuesdays and Thursdays. If you guys uh, do have preference in terms of time, I'd be interested to hear that too. So leave that down in the comments uh, and let me know. Okay, thank you. I'll talk to you guys later. Cheers.